is Kyle Rainey. I'm the lead pastor here at Eastside Baptist Church. I'm so glad you're here uh, this morning where it's 50 degrees in July. That's my fault. I hate heat and I prayed God would bring the cold so you can blame me. I'm okay with that. I literally hate heat, hate everything. If it goes above 75, I'm like, it is terrible. It feels like Texas. We moved to Oregon for this anyway. God is good. A um, couple of things before we jump into our series in Exodus, I want to talk about. Yesterday, uh, Trinity Baptist Church uh, celebrates 75 years in existence. For those who don't know, Trinity Baptist Church is our sister church of ours here in Springfield. They planted uh, uh, East Side in 1958. And um, I was back in the back listening, and, and one of the ladies came up, and she was talking about the history of Trinity. And she was walking through what that looked like. And how they made this trek. I think it was from Kansas, right? Was it some people were coming from Kansas? Somewhere, somewhere far away. Or Kentucky. Kentucky, that's where it was. Kentucky, that's right. And so they made this trek over. And as I'm listening to the history, I'm thinking their history is our history. And I pray that one day, that when maybe we have our 75th anniversary, or our 100th anniversary, or whatever the case may be, there's a church somewhere that says, Eastside's history is our history. We're here in Bend, Oregon because Eastside planted a church. We're here in Corvallis because Eastside planted a church. We're here in Ashland because Eastside planted a church. We're here in Portland because Eastside planted this church. Their history is our history. We're here in Thurston in Springfield because Eastside planted a church. And so I I came away the little time I got to spend yesterday uh, listening to to all the tales of, of Trinity. I prayed that, God, will you give us such a legacy? Will you give us in our church where there are other people who come to know Christ that don't ever walk through these doors, but because of the faithfulness of your people, of sending, of the people here that are just like, we're not just going to be a come and see church, we're going to be a go and tell church. I said, Father, will you please allow that for us? And so I was, I was grateful. I heard I missed my curtain call. I left before Tim Clark uh, uh, introduced me, but I, I was, I was uh, absent, had a, had a two-year-old birthday party to go to. So sometimes those things happen, right? Secondly, um, I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about a little bit um, about what's been going on this past week. And, uh, and you know, I know you've seen the news, and I know you've seen, I don't have to rehash it. I didn't change my sermon to fit uh, the news. I felt God just continually press on me. We need to, we need to hit Exodus today. But I will say this. Um, every single person alive, every person, no matter what they look like, Creed, color, ethnicity, background were made in the image of God. And and I think we can sit here and say, well, I support these lives, or I support these lives, or I support the police, or I support everybody. That's fine. I I want us to take a step back and go, I support Jesus. And I I want to ask the question of you and of myself, what does that look like for us? How does the church respond when things like this happen? I, I have never, and I mean, I've only been on this earth for 35 years. I almost said 34. I'm always trying to give myself a year. Um, and and I, have, I have yet to feel the tension that we feel right now. Now, some of you lived through some of that in the 60s and 70s, and you can say, well, this feels a lot like that, and that may be the case. But I, I'm going to say right now that, that I think it's a grand opportunity for the church, and, and I'm talking about our little corner of the world, in Springfield, our little corner. We can't make changes in Washington, D.C. We can't hope to even affect maybe even Portland, but, but I know we can change our corner of the world. So what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? And I can say right now, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't have a 10-point rhyming sermon for you this morning that shows you how racial reconciliation happens. Um, I, I, all I know is that I know everybody's made in the image of God, and I'm praying God will give us the answers for the church to have such a prime opportunity to stand up. And as I'm watching this unfold, and, and I'm from DFW originally, I mean, that's where, that's where we planted churches, and so I have friends, and, and there are police officers, and when I watch this unfold, I mean, my heart is breaking, my heart is breaking to see the violence happening against certain people, my heart is breaking, I mean, all over the place, and I just kept thinking... You know, I, I went through stages. I don't know, did you go through stages? First, I was upset, then angry, then and upset again, and heartbroken. And this morning, I woke up, and not really knowing how I was going to feel about it, and God just said, like, like no. Like, no, I'm not going to take this. Like, I'm not going to just sit here and watch the newsreel dictate what I'm going to feel. I'm not going to stand back and go, okay, this happened again, so I'm going to be silent and not say anything about it and just hope it all goes away. No, I'm going to let my children inherit an earth, a world, a country, a culture that is better than the one I received. 
So I am now Starworth. I feel just firm in my heart and conviction that it is up to the church now to step up because we've relied on other things and they're not working. So now it's the church, I think, that really needs to stand up and say, we are all sisters and brothers. We are all one. We have for the love of humanity, God gave his son Jesus and what makes us all equal, what makes every one of us in this room equal, is we all need a savior to save us. I don't care how rich or poor you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care where you came from or where you're going. All of us need Jesus. All of us. That makes us all equal no matter what's in your bank account or what your past has been or what your future will hold. We all need Christ. And so this morning I woke up and I'm just like, no, I will not lay down and take it. I will not sit here and just allow things to all around me evolve into chaos. We will stand firm and we will preach the gospel. I mean, this morning, I have dear friends here with me this morning, they're visiting, who used to be former IMB missionaries to Russia. I don't know if you've seen the news, but it's not just happening on this side of the world. It's happening over there. Russia, this week, I think yesterday, infused a law that says, if you are a Christian, you cannot evangelize outside of your church. You cannot gather in homes and talk about Jesus. You can't proselytize. You can't do these things. And if you do it in church, you've got to get a permit. That's Russia. That's a developed country. First world. And so it's not just happening here. Our brothers and sisters now that are in Moscow and Minsk and all over the eastern border and, and, and beyond are just now sitting here waking up to the news going, well, what do we do now? Can I tell you, the world's not going to get better. Because this isn't the last stop. And when we're all up in heaven one day worshiping God, it won't matter who next to you and what they look like. And so this morning, I did, I'm not angry, I'm passionate, and I'm Star Wars, and I just want to stand up and go, no, 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 we will not sit back and let it unfold in front of us. We will do something about it. We will reach out to our brothers and sisters in other churches and to our black churches, our Hispanic churches and our, our Asian churches. And we will say, how do we get together as the body of Christ? And how do we have conversations? And how do we rectify these problems? And how do we stand? And maybe we can't affect anything outside of this town, but in Springfield, Oregon, we can. Now, that's not part of the sermon. That's extra. You're welcome. All right, here we go. It had nothing to do with what we're talking about today. All right, Exodus. Here we go, Exodus. We are in the book of Exodus right now. We're not going line by line or we'd be here for five years. You don't want that. I don't want that. But typically, uh, we go through uh, books of the Bible line by line exegetically. We're hitting the main things of Exodus. And here's what I want to tell, and I said it last week. I want to tell you again this week. When we look at the Exodus story, right, that is God freeing the people of Israel from slavery, from Egypt, sending his servant Moses, it is parallel to our lives in the gospel. How Jesus has come and freed us from the slavery of sin. And that Jesus was sent like Moses was sent to make us captives be free. And taste freedom that only grace can provide. So that's what I want you to see. Last week we talked about how sometimes we don't believe God sees, hears, or knows us, but he does. And you had Israel crying out for 430 years, God, will you come and redeem us? And he waited 430 years, and then he sent his servant. And I want to tell you right now, just to reiterate what I talked about last week, God sees you, he knows you, he hears you, and he's going to intervene. And so this week, we get a little bit further into the story of the Exodus story. And I want to touch upon a moment in the Exodus story that really is really overlooked a lot. There's a moment where Moses and Aaron first come to Pharaoh, you know, and it's that old Baptist song, right? Let my people go, right? See, Wayne, I could do baritone. I told you. He won't let me sing up here. He refuses to let me sing. I tell him I've got range. I've got game. He don't believe it, but whatever. That's fine. That's fine. You're lucky I don't write your checks. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is, um, and they cut me off. See, see, that's like, <laughs> touche. Yep. Yeah. We have a staff meeting directly after <laughs> this service. We all need to chat. The topic will be church discipline. Um, anyway. <laughs> A lot of passages from Timothy about your pastor. Anyway, the thing is, the thing is, here's the thing. 
Aaron and Moses are in front of Pharaoh, and, and he asks him, let him go, and I'm going to go ahead and spoil the story for you. He says no, and he increases, because of them asking, he increases the hardships for Israel. He takes away the straw that they use to make bricks. Usually his people, you know, Pharaoh's people, the Egyptians would go gather straw and bring it to the, the bricklayers, the brick builders, the Israelites, and it would make their production of bricks a little bit easier. And I read somewhere where um, the average Israelite could make around 800 to 1,000 bricks a day, which is just insane. I don't know what kind of bricks they're making. That's not Acme right there, so I don't know what that is. But So it would be even more difficult for them to do. And, and we kind of brush past this part, but I want to just kind of rest in this spot right now because here's why I want, where I want to go. When God is bringing redemption to his people, when God is bringing redemption to your life, to my life, whether it's your first time in a relationship with Jesus, maybe he's taking you, maybe you know Jesus and he's taking you out of sin. Maybe there's a secret sin that you're dealing with and he's walking you through that time. Redemption is often going to look much more difficult than what we anticipated. We want comfort because that's what we are as human. We want comfort. We want things to be easy. And unfortunately, a lot of us have bought into a really terrible preaching and theology that that's exactly what we deserve. We deserve, God, I believe in you. Now you need to work for me. This is how I want this to play out. I confess all my sins, but I want this to play out just like this. I want it to be easy. I want it to be comfortable. And so my question to you is, if that's your attitude, are you looking for redemption or are you looking for relief? Are you looking for redemption, which means that you're looking to be free of slavery? of whatever you're enslaved to, or are you looking for relief? You just want temporary satisfaction and you're giving God ultimatum saying, if it doesn't look like this, then I won't do X, Y, Z. We are creatures that desire comfort. And it's particularly bad here in this wonderful country we call the United States because we are given a lot of comforts that other countries don't get. So we've gotten used to it. We've, I mean, can you imagine some of you? I mean, those who are maybe millennial generation or even my generation here, can you imagine there was a time that people could not take pictures on their phone. Scare, I know, I know. There was a time you couldn't get on the internet or there was a time before Facebook. <gasps> I know, I know. I, look, 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 it's true, Google it. I lived through it. When we were in China picking up our daughter, we went, uh, one day we went, we had saved up our money and, and, um, and, you know, on our own and just kind of put a little bit back so we could go to Disneyland. Disneyland is super cheap in Hong Kong if you ever want to go, just super cheap. So we were going and we were on a carousel because my kids want to, I mean, there's all of Disney magic here. And my kids are like, let's go on a carousel. I'm like, you can do a carousel whenever you want to. There's the elephants and the teacups. You want a carousel? Okay. So we're on this carousel and literally like, you know, of course we stick out a little bit in Hong Kong. And so we're sitting there in the carousel and I'm just watching the people are getting on this carousel. And what are the first thing they do? What do you think they do? Selfie. Yeah. They pull up their, their phone like, because if it's not on social media, it really didn't happen. It's like, there was a time before that. I promise it happened. There was a time before that. And the reality that we need to face is that we love comfort and we love to be catered to, but sometimes God's plan for redemption and for us to get where he wants us to go means that you're going to go through some valleys and it's going to be hard. And there are pastors this morning that will preach, if you love Jesus enough, if you have enough faith, nothing ever bad will ever happen to you. And that is junk. It's ridiculous. There's a problem with that. It's called the Bible. Like, <laughs> Look at the people who followed Jesus, his disciples, his homeboys, right? They all died for their faith. Following Jesus was a terrible retirement plan. Following Christ is difficult and hard, but in the end, it's sweet. Redemption is much sweeter than relief. And you may be tempted like the Israelites to go back to slavery because it's familiar. But God wants you to take you through redemption. He wants you to be more like his son Jesus and less like yourself. Because in that moment, in that place is really where freedom lies. Do you want redemption or do you want relief? Exodus chapter five is where we're starting. Exodus chapter five, starting in verse one. Aaron and Moses had gone to the people of Israel and they showed them all these signs and wonders and said, God has sent us. And the people of Israel are just ecstatic. They're like, okay, God's answered our call. 430 years, God has answered our call. He has sent Moses and Aaron and we will be freed. I mean, it's, it's a done deal. So then here's their interaction with Pharaoh. It says, afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, 
Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, let's not miss this part. This is actually a crucial, crucial statement and interaction between gods. And here's what I mean. You've got, you've got demigod, little g, Pharaoh, who thinks he's a god because he acts like one. He tells Israel when to eat, sleep, and die. When to work, when to rise, when to go, when to come. He is their god. For all intents and purposes, he's their god. And here is two men affronting him with a separate god that is calling his people, Pharaoh's people, out to go worship him and not do their work. So don't miss this. This is crucial. This is Moses and Aaron putting their lives on the line, knowing they're affronting the deity of Egypt. People felt Pharaoh was God. They saw him as that. And if we're honest, a lot of Israelites probably felt that way too. When you seek redemption in Christ, when you go through the path and want to kill sin, that secret sin that you've been holding on to, the enemy will be right there to whisper and you go, oh, you don't want to do that. Now, I know we're Baptists, and I get that, right? I love Baptists. You're like the third uncle that's just at the parties and they're weird. I love them. I've been Baptist my whole life. But one thing we don't like to talk about is spiritual warfare. We don't like it. It's weird. It's, it's hocus pocus. It's, it's weird. It is real. Just look at the newsreel this last week. I mean, come on. See those cops? They're bad. Go shoot them. I mean, come on. It is real. And the enemy hates it so much when you want to be more like Jesus. Now, luckily, we know in the end, God has the victory. We've got the playbook already. We know how it concludes. But when you go to your sin and you face your sin and says, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want this anymore. God, help me. The enemy will be there like, do you really want, because that's hard. Redemption is difficult. Why don't you come over here? Here's relief. You can go back to the sin. Doesn't it feel good? I mean, I know you feel guilty afterwards, but in that moment, doesn't it feel good to gossip, to be the adulterer, to be the addict, to be the liar, to be the thief? Doesn't it feel good? I mean, you're familiar. You know that because that's who you are. You're slaves. You're not free people to go. And we buy into the slave mentality, these lies that the enemy tells us because we see ahead of us, redemption is so difficult, but relief seems so much easier And so you have a clash of gods. And when it's you, you're not going against Pharaoh. You're usually going against yourself. You're making yourself your own functional savior. And there's nothing more that we like to worship more than ourselves. Verse 3. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said then, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many. So that's Pharaoh confessing, I'm scared. The enemy is frightened from the people of God. They are many. And you make them rest from their burdens. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their freedom. Foremen, excuse me. You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore, the cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regards to these lying words. Often when we cry out to God, we have certain expectations. We often give God ultimatums and say, well, Lord, if, if, you, can't, if you can't do something for me in this moment, if you can't make it happen this way, then I don't know if I want to do it. And we give these expectations to God and we place our own expectations on God. And there's a verse that we abuse all the time. It's in Romans. It says, and therefore God works all things for good for those who love God. Do you know it? Do you know this one? Yes? If you don't know it, just say yes because it makes you feel better. It'll make my point here in a minute. Yes? You know it? Amen. All right. Good. Y'all read your Bible. Um, your, so that's true. God does work everything out for good. But it's his good. And his good may not always look like your good. Is this a safe place? Can I confess something? 
When I first got into ministry, I promised God I would save Christianity from itself. Small task. I was arrogant. I was going to plant a church, and I was going to be the next big thing to hit the United States. People were going to buy my books. They were going to come hear me speak. Now, I never told anybody this because that sounded like really arrogance, and that's what it was. But God and I had a pact. First six months of our church plant, we blew up. We had 100 kids, and I say kids because I was the oldest person in the room at 25. 100 college students worshiping God, getting saved, and life was great. And then my worship leader, six months into it, came to me and says, hey, I'm jetting. Got an offer from a big church. I pay a lot more than you do. All right, whatever. Because me and God got a pact. When he left, no one left. I was like, see, it's all about me. And as the weeks went on, Monday night I was out, Tuesday night I was out, Wednesday morning I was out, Thursday. Because what I had done is I had gathered a following of people following Kyle and not Jesus. And they all relied on me. And everyone was baby Christians and people's marriages were falling apart. And I'm sitting here trying to fix them all together, having no clue what I was talking about. I had a plan, and God was not sticking to that plan. Thankfully, a friend of mine was wise enough to say, you're drowning. And I was like, no, no, look, look at my success. Look at all these people that are coming. Look at all these things. We have a cool name for our church. It was a Hebrew name. I mean, come on, who doesn't want that? You know? He said, you're drowning. And the best thing we ever did was merge our churches together. And then I had a team. But now I had a team. It wasn't the Kyle show anymore. I had four other elders on my team. They had to share the spotlight. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. That took a little adjusting. I was still the best looking one, but it still, it was adjustment. It was adjustment. It was really adjustment. But since that day, you know what? And you can ask the search committee when they called me and said, hey, do you want to think about being our pastor? I said, well, what's your government like? What's your structure like? Well, we have these things called shepherds. All right, I'm in. Because I'm not about a one-man show. God has just completely ripped that off of me. He's humbled me in so many more times than I can imagine. And that's the only reason why I ever went to step two with this church. My plans have not come to fruition. I don't speak in front of thousands. I don't go and speak at conferences. But I'm happy. I have more joy than I've ever had in my life. I come here every Sunday knowing that this is exactly where I need to be and hopefully where I need to be and get to be for many years to come. But it took a lot of bumps in the road to realize that this is where I needed to be and where I wanted to be. And it was hard. When God is trying to refine you and redeem you, it'll be easy to go run to relief. But redemption is often wrought with trials and tribulations. But as James 1 says, but it's an opportunity for faith. So when things don't happen the way you think they're going to happen, how do you cry out? And the fact is that when we put expectations on God, like Israel, here Aaron had heard Moses and they said, okay, we're going to be freed. And then all of a sudden they wake up the next morning and go, wait, wait, you're not going to get straw for us anymore? And their labor got more difficult. They had a couple of things probably happen. Some of them probably just got disappointed, right? Like we're disappointed. In God sometimes. I know it's scary to say in church, right? But are you disappointed sometimes in God? Sure you are. Did he really disappoint you? No. But do you feel it? Yeah, you do. You're discouraged because you bought into a karma God? A God, like, I, I came to you, and I'm a good person, so you're supposed to love me. You're supposed to do things for me. You're supposed to work for me, right? If God gave us what we really deserved, woe is us. God doesn't work in karma, thank goodness, because we could never be good enough to receive his mercy and grace. God doesn't say, will you perform for me so then I can love you? He said, I performed for you on the cross with Jesus Christ so that you'll know what love is. Redemption is difficult and hard, and there's gonna be some value. Some of it may not be. Some of you may go through a process and it's smooth sailing, and praise God for that, but I found most of the most... Refining moments in my life come at the beginning and the end of difficulties. So in the midst of those storms and trials, when you cry to God, are you crying out because you're disappointed, you're depressed, 
Have you put expectations on him that, you, that never were meant to be put on him? Do you step back and say, though, you have a plan for me that you work all things out for good. For those who love you, I love you, and I know the redemption is coming. And the reality is, I may not see the fruition of the redemption until I'm dead. But even when death, when I meet my Savior face to face in heaven, redemption has come. And so obviously, they're pretty upset, Israel. <clears throat> so you're going to have ch- go have a chat with God's messengers, right? I know that you've done this yet, but I have had a church member many moons ago. We would pray about a situation. We prayed for like six months about a situation when it didn't come to, it was a job thing. When he didn't get the job, he came to me and he got mad at me. I didn't say the right prayers. <laughs> I was like, have you seen my children? God is still have not <laughs> listened to me yet on some of them. And my wife was like, have you seen my husband? tell her she is a living example of God's grace because she's married to me. Um, so they go to interact with him. Jump down to verse 20. So after this hard burdens were put on them and they didn't give them the straw, Israelites go and they meet Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servant and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. And then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why do you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. So it's like the blame game, you know? Like here comes Israel, and they're going to Moses, and like, hey, what's up, dude? Did you get the message wrong? Did you misinterpret it? And what does Moses do? He doesn't give a rebuttal. What does he do? God, what's up? Did you get the message wrong? (laughs) Right? He's just passing the buck, right? Because what Israel was doing is they were mad at Moses and Aaron, but they were furious at God. They were upset with God. They were questioning the redemption plan. Now, I'm going to put this question out. I'm going to drop a grenade and I'm going to back off and not get back to it till later, all right? Is it okay to question God? Is it okay to question what he has before you? I want to put a pin in that. We're going to come back to it in just a minute, okay? But the Israelites were obviously upset because what their expectations were didn't get met. So often our expectations aren't met. And so often we want so badly to have evidence that things are going the way they're going. You know, I've heard it said that faith equals evidence. How many times have you ran into someone like that that you're maybe like trying to share the gospel with? I just need to see proof that there's a God. I need to have evidence in front of me to know so I can have faith. I'm a scientific person. I'm whatever the case may be. You know, I, I ran around with the academia world. I totally didn't fit in. It was great. But I ran around with the academia world for a while when I was teaching college for seven years. And, you know, we'd be in lunches or meetings or whatever. And they're like, so what do you do outside of teaching? And I was like, well, I'm a pastor. And like, what, what? Why? Literally a guy, um, gosh, what was his name? His first name was Jack. And he hated when I called him Jack. So it was like doctor something but just Jack, I don't know, Dr. Jack, whenever I told him that, he was like, I mean, literally his, his answer to that was, what, why? I said, what do you mean, why? And he goes, why, why would you ever do that? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He's like, and they, they, does, does the dean of the department know? <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, he got the call for references. They could not fathom that someone who is an educator could believe in a story. That there was a man long ago that came and took upon the sins of the world so that we may be free. God's plan often doesn't make sense. And oftentimes we say, well, we just gotta have faith. But if to have faith, I need to have evidence. But look at Hebrews 11 real quick. It's up here behind me. Hebrews 11, one says this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of the things not seen. Now, let, me, let me walk through that real quick. It says, Paul says, or who I think wrote Hebrews, Paul says, in my opinion, you can email me later, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith will come to fruition one day. And I say this a lot, but I'm going to go ahead and say it again. My past and how I was, the fact that I'm on this stage preaching to you shows me that my faith has been assured in the hope that I had in Jesus. There is no reason I should be up here. I have not earned it. But God has a comical way of using broken vessels to do his work and his bidding. 
And that's exactly what he's done in my case. I am just a rebel clinging to the mercies of Jesus every day, just like you. But I have assurance because I have hope. I have hope because I have come to realize when I explored all the religions that were out there in college, I came to realize that the one religion that did not require me to climb some moral pragmatic steps to a better life so that the deity could love me was Christianity because God climbed the steps down to me where I was and met me in where I was at and forgave me so I could be brought high as his son. That's my hope and that's what I'm assured in. I'm still breathing despite my sin. It goes on, it says, in the conviction of things not seen, I have never had a conversation audibly with God. I haven't. He may have with you and, and praise God. I don't know. Personally, I'm asking he doesn't do that to me. I'd be freaked out. But if he's with you doing that, right on. I do not possess charismatic gifts. I've never seen angels nor lights. But this morning when I watched my 10-year-old who at age two was diagnosed with autism and said he will never speak, he will never take care of himself, he will never talk. If you've met Noah, you know none of those are true. Raise his hand and worship the God of everything. Not caring what all these adults in this room think about him. Raise his tiny little hands up in the air because he's seen mom and dad do it and he is worshiping his brains out, loves to worship, wants to be a missionary one day. That is the conviction of things not seen. Because when the doctor told me, the child therapist told me when we were sitting in that little cramped office in Oklahoma, when he said, your son has autism, and he's sitting here and he's playing with toys, and he's not letting that diagnosis bother him. He's just having a ball with himself playing these toys. And I really had despair at that moment and said, God, you've got to show me evidence that you are who you say you are in this young man's life. And God was not, he did not just automatically heal him. It took till he was four to speak his first word, seven to get his all his mobility back. And now at 10 years old, he reads at grade level. He's in school. He's doing amazing. He wants to be a missionary. He loves Jesus. He loves his new sister and brother that we just adopted. And that is the conviction of things just not seen. That's how I know God is real. That's my evidence. I don't need God to talk to me face to face because he moves in my heart through the spirit every day. And he reminds me of the gospel every day. He reminds me that I am a sinner and on my best day, I deserve death. My very best day, when I let help every little old lady across the street, when I go and volunteer all my hours, when I have to you know, really smile and listen like I'm attentive in staff meetings and elder meetings, like on my very best day, Without Jesus, I deserve death because of the sin that I have inherited by being born. And it is that grace that I am not ashamed of what has happened in my past. I can stand here in the heart of redemption knowing that I didn't seek relief. I wanted real redemption and that's what God brought me. And I know some of you are just out there like, I need to see some evidence I need to have evidence to know so I can have faith. And I pray that God gives you the faith to believe today because the fact that you're a sinner and you're allowed to do what you do and sit here, that is evidence enough for me and for you that God is real and that he loves you. Get back to Exodus chapter five, verse 22 and 20, excuse me, sorry. Chapter six, verse one through nine. So, People are mad. They're mad at Moses. Moses turns to God and says, hey, what's up? What's that all about, right? So I'm going to get back to that question here in a minute. But look at God's response. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I'll do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people. That's what we talked about last week. I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered 
my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. That last piece is probably the pivotal piece in all of Exodus. Why does God do any of this stuff? To know that everyone will know, and he'll talk about this later, that the Egyptians, the Israelites, and the whole world will know that I am God. God does things and redeems us for his glory and his glory alone. We just get to be the benefactors of that. Now, he says a few important things here, and we're just running out of time, so I don't have a lot of time to go through all of them, but the reality is Moses is coming to God, and he has questions about the plan. And God responds in such a way to remind them. So a couple of things God does. Once he gets historical, he says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The stories that you have heard of, that was me. The stories that happened, the reason you're here where you're at at this point, that was me. And secondly, he goes through, talks about this covenant he has with them. God is reminding him of his promises, that he's a God that keeps his promises and that he will not be dictated by his creation. His creation will not tell him when to jump, when to go left, when to go right, when to go forward, when to go backwards. His plan will unfold exactly how it's supposed to in perfection. And we with faith unseen will go forward in conviction of the hope that we have. Finally, he says something I said that was very important. He says, and I will take them to be my people and I will be their God. Now, when you're in the midst of going through redemption... And if it's, let's just say that you are struggling with this thing called Jesus and should I lean into the gospel and be this follower of Christ, as you're walking through these times, know that this is going to be valleys and there are going to be hardships, but there is a God that loves you and has come before you and you will realize pretty soon that you are not the center of the world. And I know that's difficult. It was difficult for me to handle that. It's difficult for some of us to handle that. But God has been working from the beginning of time. He is a God of many covenants and he keeps his covenants. We look back and we can look for the book before this in Genesis and we see in the garden when God is talking to Adam and Eve, right? The first people he ever created. You know, the world was great for a whole five minutes, right? Chapter one, chapter two, then sin. And in the curse, as he's talking to the serpent and talking to Eve, he actually gives us hope. He says, and Eve, your seed or your offspring or Jesus will one day and crush the offspring, the seed of the serpent or Satan, meaning that Jesus will come and crush the head of sin and death once and for all. God has given us the plan of redemption from the very beginning. And we see in Exodus, we see in Esther, we see in Joel, we will see in Hosea, we will see in book after book in Isaiah and minor minor prophets all the way up to the New Testament. We see the acts of redemption, the leading up to the fulfillment of that promise to when Jesus walks the earth. And in John 1, it says, and behold, the word of God who's come to dwell amongst us. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus for the very first time, he says, the lamb of God that's come to take away the sins of the world. That is the fruition of the promise that he gives right here. I am the Lord and you will be my people and I will be your God. I will take you to be my people and I'll be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the, in the midst of trials, when you're in that redemption and you are fighting relief and not wanting relief, but you truly want redemption, you don't want to be back enslaved in slavery and sin. You want redemption. You said, Lord, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to, to do what you need to happen for me to be more like your son Jesus and less like me and kill this sin. Remember when you cry out to God, remember he is the Lord your God. He is your God, your individual. Now, he is all of our gods, right? And I usually talk at a corporate level, but I want to put it down to the individual level. He knows you. From last week, like I told you, he sees you, he hears you, he knows you, he loves you, and he is intervening at this very moment and doing things that you, you may never see until the other side of heaven. But the older I get, I can look back in my life and go, that's why that happened. That's why you took my family on welfare for six months. I get that now. That's why you called us to adopt. That's why you called us to Springfield, Oregon. That's why you've, and and I can just look back and see why God is doing, and I don't know it all. I have no idea what tomorrow brings. He He may choose to take me home tomorrow, but I know that I'm in the midst of his redemption plan. 
And there are still valleys to come that are going to refine me and refine you. But in that midst of those trials, do not lose faith and run to comfort and say, no, no, I want relief again. I want relief. No, because on the other side of this difficult redemption trial is grace, is hope, is completeness, is wholeness, is that 2 Corinthians 5.17, the new creation in Christ that he's making you to be. So stand up, be strong in the Lord, and know that he has a plan. Now the question comes, can I question God? Can I tell God, hey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thrilled about this plan. I'm going to tell you, yeah. As long as you don't give God ultimatums. <laughs> I have conversations like that with God all the time. I'll be in my, usually happens in my car. Uh, I don't know. I drive a really big car. We have a really big family. So I'm easily noticed. And some of you even said, I see you talking in a car. Are you like talking to the kids? I'm like, no, I'm typically praying that God would get us to wherever we need to go before I pull over and do something to the children. But then secondly, is what happens is I'm usually, if I'm ever you see me and I'm talking, I'm not usually talking like, like sermonizing. I'm not usually singing along in my radio in my little Jeep Honda Pilot over there. I'm, uh, I'm praying. I'm, I'm telling God. And sometimes the conversation goes, God, I don't like this. Don't like it. Don't like this change coming. Don't like that I was exposed in this. I don't like how that played out, but I'm going to trust you. I think that's okay. It's human. Look at Psalm 22. This is David writing in the Psalms. Psalm 22. You can look up here on the screen. You don't have to turn to your, in your Bible. It says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on your praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. So notice what David does here. He says, God, where are you? I don't sense you. My enemies feel like they're all around me. Father, I don't know what's going on. I cry by day, but I don't hear you. I find no rest. However, you are the God of my fathers. You are enthroned in holiness. Ultimately, David says, look, I don't get it, and I have questions, but I trust you. And I think that's what prayer is a lot of times. For me, I don't know about you, but that's my prayer. When I'm going through a redemption trial, and God's trying to pull me out of some sin, or whatever the case may be, or exposing sin, it's usually like, Lord, I don't get this, but I trust you. I don't understand this, but I trust you. Maybe I'm not meant to understand this, but help me with my unbelief. Help me with my unbelief in that you're sovereign, that you're going to take care, that you're going to control this situation, that you're going to alleviate these burdens eventually. Help my unbelief. I think I pray that prayer more than anything on this world. Help my unbelief. Not my faith. I have faith. I have faith that God is who he is, and I'll never lose that faith. I've seen too much and experienced too much to ever lose that faith in Jesus. But I have unbelief, if I'm really honest. And I'm maybe a pastor, I'm just a man that has unbelief sometimes. That, that things aren't going like I thought they would go. And so, yeah, I think it's okay to talk to God like that. Those words may seem familiar at the very beginning. That's the words Jesus quoted when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ is not questioning God. He's not saying, what, where have you gone or, or why have you had this happening? He is just quoting and allowing us to see in Psalm 22. He's like, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lord, this hurts. This is hard. This is difficult. This is rough, but I trust you. He also did to fulfill a prophecy because later on in Psalm 22, we don't have it up here. It goes, and they have uh, pierced my side. They have gambled for my clothes. How would David know that? except for he was prophesying what would happen to Jesus. And I bring that point up to let you know that in the middle of your redemption, those trials, when you're crying out to God, know that God has instinctly and sovereignly and perfectly lined and sewed all these things together for his good. And in the end, redemption will come for you and for me. And glory will be had by God. But you may be like Israel right now, God, this is not what I expected. I'm mad. I'm upset. God can take that. His ego is not so fragile. Just as long as we're not sinning in the midst of that. I say, God, look, I don't get this. It's hard. I think a lot of us too feel like we have to be hard and tough and rough, but you know what? That's what, God was, that's what God's for. I find vulnerability to be a lot more healing sob than anything else I've ever had in my life. 
saying, God, I don't get this. And in him, we be strong. So you may be where Israel's at and you may be tempted to run back to slavery. You may be tempted to run back to that sin because it just feels better. It's relief. But I promise you, friends, please, 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 turn towards Jesus and go towards redemption. It's this much sweeter road, though it may be wrought with trials. It's a much sweeter ending and result to that journey than it is being back in slavery. Some of you know Jesus, but you run back to the slavery of sin. The cell door is wide open. There's no jailer. There's no chains, but you're still making bricks because it's familiar and because doing something else is hard. Let me, let me leave you with this. Romans chapter eight, verse one, my favorite verse in all the Bible. Um, and I don't have it up here, but it, this is my favorite verse in all the Bible. And then we'll get to 818 here in a minute. Eight one says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love that verse. I don't know. It's not, there's nothing fancy about it. Uh, when you break down the Greek, it's exactly what it says it is. There's no, there's no uh, cute little twists and turns. I can't do a word study for you and show you my seminary education. They're, they're just, it's just plain forward. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. Some of you are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is not your end result. Only glory, only grace, only mercy, only oneness with God. 8.18 says this, and Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Oh God, has ever been a verse so true than this week? And so when you're in the midst of redemption and a trial and you're wondering, God, why has the straw been taken away? Why is this not happening like I want it to happen? I want to leave you with a couple of things. Number one, do not believe the lies of instant gratification that only usually sin brings. Don't run back to relief. Stay the course of redemption. Secondly, do not buy into the lies that God owes you anything. He's given you everything in Christ Jesus. Everything you've ever wanted will be in Christ Jesus. Your family, your kids, your job, that's icing on the grace cake that he's given you. That's all that is. And we are thankful for it, but just realize God has given you all that you need in Jesus. Thirdly, run towards redemption. This morning, run towards redemption. Why? Because there's no condemnation in redemption. There's no separation from eternity of with God in redemption. And when you run towards redemption and you realize on the other side of redemption that Jesus is there, to take away the condemnation that you and I both have placed upon ourselves because of the sin in our lives. You can confidently say, for I consider that the sufferings in this present time, the loss of my job, my health failing, the sin I'm battling, the friends I'm losing, the new opportunities I'm gaining that just seem mysterious to me, the conflicts I have in relationships, the conflicts I have with myself, this present time, when Russia takes away the ability for Christians to tell their neighbors about Jesus, when people are killing police officers out of a reactionary hate that is built up in their heart, when police officers and others are using violence, when people are being treated, mistreated, when we are looking now in disparaging looks at our police officers going, Do they, are they for us? So they, they are for us. Your neighbor who's African-American is for you. We should be for them. And if we lose our lives defending those people, then we lose our lives because our present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to come. We are in such a season like this. And guess what? Tomorrow, the same thing's gonna happen. We're gonna wake up and something else is gonna happen. A bomb in the Middle East. Terrorism attack locally. Another officer loses his life. So what are we gonna do? Tomorrow you're gonna wake up and your same problems are gonna be there. That addiction, knocking at your door saying, hey, 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 relief, relief. Come, come to me. Hey, it, you, remember, you remember me, right? You, you're down this road and you've done this church thing for a little bit. You remember me, right? This is much more comfortable, right? Or that broken relationship you're in right now that you're trying to make the other person complete you but you realize this isn't Jerry Maguire and they aren't gonna complete you. Those are all still gonna be there tomorrow when you wake up. Every single one of the problems and issues and redemption paths that you're walking right now are still gonna be there. 
But you know who else is going to be there? Jesus. He will be there to unite hearts together, to bound the brokenhearted for those who have hard hearts towards our law enforcement, to those who have hard hearts towards those who are of different color and race, to those who have been broken, who have been beaten, who have nowhere to go, who have nowhere to turn to. He will still be there. He will be there enthroned in the holiness saying, remember who I am. Remember the path I have before you. Remember that I've given you everything you need in Jesus. Do not run to that relief, but come to me towards redemption. It's difficult, it's hard, but in the end, you get me. And so we will not be scared. We will not cower in the face of sin. We will not run to our buildings and huddle up here and say culture is terrible and the world is terrible. And we need to just stay here because it's safe here. It's not safe here. Anybody could walk through here. And guess who's the main target? We are not safe. This world is not meant to be safe. But we are forever secure in the arms of Christ. So we consider that the sufferings of this present time take away our straw. Take it away. Burden us more. Enemy, throw it at us, world, throw things at us because we will not consider the sufferings of this present time compared to the glory that awaits us because in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We come to you as your servant. We come before you as people who are stalwart and who are affirmed that we have Jesus and we know that relief is not the answer, but only redemption can help us. So, Father, for those who are far from God this morning, who do not have Christ as their personal Savior, bring redemption to them today. Change their life, change their family's life, change their history and their future. God, for those who us who love Jesus, who are following Christ, but we're going through just some stuff right now where you're trying to cleanse us of sin. Let us cling to your redemption plan and, and give us the freedom to ask questions, but give us the faith and help our unbelief that you are sovereign. And Father, for our nation, remind us that Jesus loves all the children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white. That we are all precious in the sight. And this we pray. Amen.